Hello everyone, uh, it's Willing Away, and welcome back to Through the Parks. Uh, today we're going to be covering our third park, which was picked out by a friend of mine. Uh, so we'll be heading to Bryce Canyon. Uh, there was like, this is another one, I'm not surprised, Bryce Canyon is pretty, it's a pretty remote um, park, and it's also right next to Zion Park, which is a pretty big park, so it doesn't get as much... Uh, visitors or you know like people visiting but it's still more than uh people who visit big bend which was our last national park so there's not a lot to cover in fact it actually has less history um than big bend so we'll get through this pretty fast this will probably be an, another shorter one um but yeah so we're gonna start off like we always do with the overall info of the park so bryce canyon national park is located in southwestern utah the major feature of this park, so the one thing that most people go to witness, uh, is where it actually got its name, Bryce Canyon. Uh, however, it's not actually a canyon. Um, it's a collection of giant amphitheaters. Um, so it's like, I was like, I was looking at a lot of them, and they always mention it as like an amphitheater, but it looks like just like a ton of, um, like spires almost it's, it's really cool looking you, you have to look up bryce canyon it's for someone i'm not really interested in the canyons and deserts but i would visit it looks like something you could uh you could have fun with Ugh, big yawn <laughs> so um those giant amphitheaters that i was talking about are located on the eastern side of the palinsaugunt plateau Another cool feature in the park are the geological structures called uh, hoodoos, which are formed by frost weathering and stream erosion of the river and lake bed sedimentary rocks. A lot of this park talks about erosion. Uh, that is kind of its, its specific. Big Bend was like fossils and Yellowstone was like your geysers. This one is like erosion and what it has done to the canyon and the rocks. So the colors of the canyon provide beautiful views for visitors um it's a canyon so it range it like ranges from like your reds your orange uh to even like white um but it, it's still a really beautiful canyon so bryce canyon is yet again a very small park and much smaller than its neighboring park of zion however bryce canyon sits at a much higher elevation compared to zion the rim of the park so just the rim um varies from eight thousand to nine thousand feet of elevation. So the canyon was first settled by Mormon pioneers in the 1850s and was named after one of them who was Ebenezer Bryce who stayed in the area in like 1874. So the area around the park was originally a national monument and then was declared by President uh, Warren G. Harding in 1923. It was declared a, na a national monument by him in 1923. However, in 1928, it was finally declared a national park, and that is where the national park starts. So, this park covers 35,835 acres, uh, and due to it being relatively small, it receives very few visitors compared to uh, Zion and the Grand Canyon, which, surprisingly, Zion and the Grand Canyon and Bryce Canyon are all related in a way, and I'll, I'll get into that later, but they're all related in a way, and that's why they kind of get paired together. But I just found this out and I thought it was cool. But yeah, so in 2018, the canyon received 2,679,478 visitors, and then which actually increased by 107,794 visitors from the prior year. So, although 2 million fucking visitors sounds like a fuck ton of visitors, and it, it does sound like a lot, and it is a lot, um, it's very small compared to, like, how many visitors there are in Yellowstone, and how many visitors are in, like, the bigger, uh, like, the bigger parks so it is still relatively a uh, a smaller park but yeah so after that we get into the geography which um was i, I like this one it, it's pretty easy to understand it's basically you know talking about like more erosion exactly where the park is so the canyon lies with uh the colorado plateau province of north america and straddles the southwestern edge of the panosagan plateau west of the Panusaugant Falls. So Panusaugant means um, home of the beaver in Pau Paute. 
which is the language of uh, the Native Americans that lived there um, a long time ago. So when you arrive in the park, you can look over the plateau's edge toward a valley containing the Fault and the Pariah River and, like, the Pariah River, like, just beyond it. So you can see a lot in this park, I found out. Like, if it is a clear day, you can see a fuck ton. Um, so Pariah also is another word in um, Paiute. It means muddy or elk water. And then the edge of Kaip. Parowitz Plateau is on the opposite side of the valley we're talking about. So Bryce Canyon, like I said before, is technically not a canyon due to the fact that it was not formed by erosion. Uh, instead, headwater erosion has caused the excavated large amphithe uh, amphitheater type shapes in what is the Penasaugan Plateau. So this erosion, this headwa headward erosion, uh, resulted in pinnacles called uh, hoodoos, that are up to 200 feet tall. If you do go visit them, they're really fucking tall. Um, and then it also, like a series of amphitheaters in the park, they extend for over 20 miles north to south. So this, these amphitheaters and these hoodoos are Bryce Canyon's like pride and joy. This is what people went to go see. Um, but yeah, it's, they're very beautiful. You look up a photo, they're gorgeous. Like the way the canyon is. I was looking at them and I'm like, you know, if I'm really into, like, canyons and stuff, this would be the perfect park, along with, obviously, your Grand Canyon and stuff like that. So, the largest one of these amphitheaters is called Bryce Amphitheater, which in itself is 12 miles long, 3 miles wide, and 800 feet deep. So, Rainbow Point is the highest part of the park. It sits at 9,105 feet, and it's at the end of a very long scenic drive that is 18 miles long. Uh, we'll get into it, but this park is really, it's a lot of a, it's a scenic park, so it's a lot of, like, driving. They do have hikes, which we'll also get into, um, but it, it's very much, like, scenic driving, so I'll mention that a couple times, but yeah. So, from this point, the Aquarius Plateau, the Bryce Amphitheater, the Henry Mountains, the Vermilion Cliffs, and the White Cliffs can all be seen from Rainbow Point. So that's kind of like, that's the overlook you kind of want to go to because you could see a ton. Um, and then, so it also has a creek that passes through the park called Yellow Creek. And where the creek leaves the park, that is the lowest part of the park. And even then, that park, that area is at 6,620 feet. Yeah, this, this place has a high elevation. So now we get into the climate. This is relatively short. This is just kind of like what weather you can see on what days. So Bryce Canyon is considered a continental climate with warm, dry summers. Uh, the park receives a total of 15 to 18 inches of rain per year. Um, yearly temps range from a minimum of 9 degrees Fahrenheit to a max of 83 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the recorded high in the park was uh, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, which I believe that was like in... 19 something and then the record load was in negative uh 26 fahrenheit and yet again that was also in the 1900s i think not 1900s like 1920 or something like that 40 1940 it's i don't have those dates on here but um i know i remember i read it and i don't know why i didn't put them on here but it was definitely it's not it hasn't happened recently the record high has not really been broken since then um now we're gonna get into the part we all love, which is the history. So archaeological surveys have shown that people have been in this area for at least 10,000 years. So we can find evidence of people uh, living in Bryce Canyon uh, 10,000 years ago. So Anasazi artifacts, um, which are th several thousand years old, have been found uh, south of the park, which, you know, kind of convinces us that people have been around here. Um, other artifacts are from the Pueblo, uh, Pueblo period and the Fre Fremont culture have been found. The Paiute Native Americans moved into the surrounding valleys and plateaus in the area right after all the other like cultures had left. Um, and so the Paute, they, they're hunters and gatherers for most of their food, but they also did have um, cultivated products in their diet sometimes. Uh, so they did kind of like everything almost. They grew some plants and then they also hunted and gathered for their food. So, uh, the Paiute 
in the area developed a mythology about the hoodoos in the park, which I thought was very cool. So they believed that the hoodoos were the legend people whom the trickster coyote had turned into stone. Um, so at least one older Paiute said that his culture called the hoodoos, uh, I'm so sorry if I messed this up, but Enka Ku Wazawitz, which means red painted faces. Um, and it wasn't until the late 18th and early 19th century that the first European Americans explored the area. So the Native Americans were there for a long time before we, or, uh, you know, um, Europeans, Americans decided to explore the area. Um, but Mormon scouts visited the area in 1850s to see if it was good for architectural development, use for grazing, and settlement. But the first major expedition that was led by an actual U.S. Army person uh, was led by uh, Major John Weasley Powell uh, in 1872. So although uh, Mormon scouts had already kind of, you know, visited the area in 1850s, it wasn't until 1872 when we actually had, like, a legit... Uh, survey going. So Powell and his team surveyed the Severi and Virgin River area as a part of like a larger and bigger survey. So they just kind of did this as like a small, this was a small part. Like they didn't go there to survey Bryce Canyon or what we would know now as Bryce Canyon. They went there to survey love just in general, the Colorado plateaus. So the map makers kept many of the Powiat place names. Um, so none of the names really changed. This is kind of how they've been, you know, the whole throughout the years. So after the survey, um, small groups of Mormons followed and then attempted to settle east of Bryce Canyon along the uh, Perea River. In 1873, however, the Canara Cattle Company started to use the area for cattle grazing. Uh, and then the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints sent Scottish immigrant Ebenezer Price and his wife Mary to settle the land in Perea Valley because they, uh, he, he was a carpenter, so they were like, his carpentry skills would be useful in, you know, settling a new place, uh, so they sent him with his wife to what would now be Bryce Canyon. So the family decided to live right below uh, the amphitheater, which housed the main collection of hoodoos in the park. Uh, and so... Bryce would graze his cows in what is now the park, which is kind of, we'll get into it, but it's why it's called Bryce Canyon. But um, he would graze his cows in that area, and he even stated that uh, with the amphitheaters, they were, um, in quotes, a hell of a place to lose a cow. Which, if you think about it, it's just a ton of spires. So if you lost a cow, you're, like, walking through this maze of spires trying to find one cow. So yeah, it is, it is a hell of a place to lose a cow. Um, he also built, due to being a carpenter, he built... A, plat uh, a road to the plateau to receive firewood and timber, and then a canal to irrigate his crops and water his animals, like get water for his animals. Eventually, other settlers eventually, you know, they called this place Bryce's Canyon, and then, which was later just called Bryce Canyon. Uh, eventually, drought, overgrazing, and flooding drove almost everyone out of the canyon. The only people who stayed were settlers who tried to create a water diversion channel, um, but eventually it failed, and most settlers then just moved out. That also included Bryce's family. They, I believe it said it, they moved to Arizona? Somewhere in Arizona, they moved, and they kind of just lived the rest of their life there. The park was first mentioned as a scenic place in a public magazine article by the Union Pacific and Santa Fe Railroads in 1916. That was, like, their first mention of it being, like, <clears throat> y'all should go see this. Uh, so, people like Forest Supervisor J.W. Humphrey promoted the scenic wonders, but due to the very poor access to the park and the remote area where the park was set, uh, visitation was a bare minimum. And I feel like that kind of still affects it today. It's it's definitely a little bit remote, but it's also due to the fact that, like, Zion's right next door, so it's like, they're kind of fighting each other, so Bryce does get the least visitors. Um, Ruby Syrett. Harold Bowman and the Perry brothers would later build uh, lodging and set up uh, tour services in the park. Um, very modest. They weren't like extravagant like we probably see now. Very modest buildings, just little stuff on Bryce Canyon. Eventually, Ruby Syrett, um also became the first postmaster of Bryce Canyon. Uh, visitation eventually increased by the early 1920s, 
uh, and that convinced the Union Pacific Railroad to start putting down a rail service to accompany uh, more tourists to the area, which also helped, you know, get visitation up because now you have more access to the area. At the same time, however, uh, con- conservationists were starting to get worried about, like, the overgrazing, the logging, and then the unregulated visitors that were going into this area, and then that is when we get our first movement to get the park protected. Uh, which makes sense. I mean, if you think about it, people have grazed on this land. So they probably didn't control how they were grazing. Definitely probably overgrazed. And then you have logging. And yet people keep saying it's a scenic place. Obviously, people are going to worry that someone is going to take advantage of this. And so they started a movement to get the park protected. Uh, this shocked me. But the National Park Service Director, Stephen Mather, proposed that the park be made into a state park. He just wanted it as a state park. However, the Utah State Legislator lobbied for a national protection. So to get it as like a national park or just like a national monument, but they were like, they were not okay with it being a state park. Which I I thought it was crazy. I was like, a state park? Which I understand. If you don't know, there's like a lot of state parks everywhere. Like, you can probably find a state park close to you. Um, At least where I am, there's like a ton of fucking state parks. Uh, But, you know, there's only a couple national parks but it's like with a place that's like has like a unique thing which we'll find out eventually because i believe this park is the really only place where you can find these like large collections of like hoodoos and amphitheaters and to think like we have that and they were wanting to just make it a state park which isn't bad a state park isn't bad but a state park is like i don't i feel like it's not as protected as national one but either way mather eventually relented and sent the recommendation to, uh, at the time, the current president, Harding, who on June 8th, 1923, made Bryce Canyon at first a national monument. Um, a road was built the exact same year that led to different overlooks and plateaus, and this made for even easier access, uh, to visitors to go visit these beautiful places in the park. Uh, from 1924 to 25, Bryce Canyon Lodge was made out of Uh, was it timber and stone that were found in the park. Uh, Eventually, in 1924, people started to work on making Bryce Canyon's uh, protection service to change from a national monument to a national park. Um, Here comes the hard part, though. About trying to make it a national monument to a national park, people were still living on that land, as far as I, I read, and so they, the government, the federal government basically had to buy the land from these people uh, before they could even choose to make it a national park, which took a while. I mean, 1924, you get this, uh, you know, trying to make it a national park, right? 1924 is when it started. The last land that was sold didn't sell until 1927, which doesn't sound crazy, but it's like three years, which is like kind of a lot if you think about it but finally on february 25th 1928 uh the bryce canyon national park was made um is someone fucking mowing right now (laughs) god damn it um but uh in 1931 president hoover annexed an adjoining area of the land south of the park so this was just a part of land that wasn't in the park at the time but he eventually did make it part of the park And in 1942, the park had gained 635 acres of land, which isn't too bad. Um, This brought the park to the current amount of acres it has now, the ones that we know. Um, Some other cool stuff is that Rim Road, which is the uh, scenic drive, was built in 1934. We're going back a bit. But it was built in 1934 by the CCC, which we heard about in Yellowstone. Uh, But that's the Civilian Conversation Corps. They built that scenic drive. Um, and then, cool fun fact, administration into this park was originally started through the neighboring park of Zion. So if you wanted to get to Bryce Canyon, you would have to go through Zion until, like, 1956, when it eventually became its own, you know, thing, and you could just go to Bryce Canyon through Bryce Canyon. Uh, another cool fun fact I thought was awesome about the history, eventually, a ship was named after the park. It is the ship of USS Bryce Canyon. Um, other cool facts are Bryce Canyon National History Association was established in 1961. Uh, they run the bookstore at the park, so there's a bookstore at the park. 
uh, and are a nonprofit. So every dollar they make from the bookstore basically goes right back into the park. Um, they help things around the park, like new roads, you know, just taking care of the park. Um, definitely benefits a smaller park like that to have an association that can benefit them. Uh, due to the increased visitation and traffic problems, the National Park Service uh, started road construction in 2004 to help prevent those. Um, and then recently on April 7th, 2020, the park was closed down due to COVID, but it is now back open and you can go visit Bryce Canyon, I believe anytime you want, as long as it is, you know, within operation hours. <laughs> so now we get into the geology, which um, I almost lost my mind trying to comprehend some of this stuff. I'm definitely not a geologist. So I try to make this as easy for me as it is to you guys, so that we can both understand what we're talking about here. So the park area shows a record of deposition that spans from the last part of the Cretaceous period to the first half of the Cenozoic area or era. Basically, uh, it like naturally decreases the land, like goes down. It's a deposition. Uh, the depositional environment around the park tends to vary. Um, the Dakota sandstone and tropic shell were deposited in warm shell waters of the Cretaceous Seaway, which eventually gets blocked up. Um, the Clary Claron formation, from which the park's uh, hoodoos are carved, was laid down as sediments in a system of cool streams and lakes, which existed 63 to 40 million years ago. Oh my, that's so old. <laughs> uh, several other formations were created, but due to erosion has mostly fade away uh, due to, like, two major periods of, like, uplift that happened. Uh, the Colorado plateaus were uplifted 16 million years ago and were then segmented into different plateaus. The Boat Mesa conglomerate and the Severa River formation were removed due to erosion during the uplift, so they're gone. Um, the uplift created vertical joints, which were eventually uh, eroded, and... The pink cliffs of the Claren Formation were eroded to form what we call the hoodoos. The red and pink on these are from hematite, the yellow is from limonite, and the purple is from pyrolusite. pyrolusite. So Bryce Canyon has one of the highest concentration of hoodoos of any place on Earth, which is why it is so special. And the formations exposed in the area of the park are the youngest part of the Grand Staircase. So when I said that um, the Grand Canyon, Bryce Canyon, and Zion are all part of something, and they're all connected, this is what I mean, the Grand Staircase. So Bryce Canyon is at the top of the staircase. They're the youngest. There are the newer stone, the stone you don't really see, you know? Zion is the middle. They are a little older stone, a little older canyons, but you can't really, you know... That's about much. Grand Canyon? Old. Fucking old. You see that canyon? You see how fucking deep it is? We got some old ass rock down there. So it's like a staircase. It is called the Grand Staircase, which I thought was really fucking cool. You know, like, this is... This is interesting. Um, but yeah, I, I thought that was cool that there was something called a Grand Staircase and that it spans those two. Um, but ecology. So, uh, although the park is kind of known for its scenic views, it does have animals and creatures. So there are more than 400 native plant species in the park, which if you're wondering, um, on the thumbnail for today's video, the plant I'm holding is called the Bryce Canyon paintbrush. So it is a native plant. Uh, I decided I'd include that. I thought it'd be special. Um, there are three life zones in the park, actually. So the lowest area of the park houses your, like, dwarf forest of Pie and Pine, Jupiter, Manazantia, Serviceberry, and Antelope Bitter Brush. In between there, you get your Aspen, your Cottonwood, your Water Birch, and your Willow. Um, Pondercero Pine Forests cover the mid elevations with Blue Spurs and Douglas Fir, and then the harshest areas have Limber Pine, Great Basin, Bristle Cone Pine, um, and then some of these are like 1,600 years old. These are old trees. So their diversity of animals isn't as diverse as like other places, but it's still relatively diverse in the park. They do have multiple different animals. So they have your foxes, your badgers, your porcupines, your elk, skunks, black bears, bobcats, and woodpeckers. Um, mule deer are actually the most common large animal in the park. But around Bryce Canyon, people started to reintroduce elk and pronghorn, 
and these creatures, these animals, tend to venture into the park. So you might see an elk or a pronghorn, but they're usually not in Bryce Canyon. You usually won't find them. It's usually, you'll, you'll probably find a mule deer before you find an elk or something like that. So the park has three species that are under the endangered list. They have the Utah prairie dog, the California condor, and the southwestern willow flycatcher. So the Utah prairie dog was reintroduced into the park, and now currently that park houses the largest protected population of Utah prairie dogs. I believe they're still endangered, but that they do house the largest population there. There are 170 species of bird that visit the park. Uh, some of these include your swift and your swallows. Most species migrate to warmer regions in the winter, uh, consider, you know, most, most migrate. Uh, although certain birds do stay in the park, so if you do visit during winter, you might see them. Those are your jays, your ravens, your nut thatchers, uh, your eagles, and your owls. They tend to stay in the park. So your mule deer, cougars, and coyotes, they migrate to the lower elevations during winter. Meanwhile, your ground squirrels and your marmot pass the winter in hibernation. So usually, uh, when it gets to winter, you're not going to see as much wildlife as you would uh, in summertime. This also opens up that there are, in a canyon, there are multiple species of reptile. So there's 11 species of reptile, and there are four species of amphibians. So the reptiles uh, can include the Great Basin Rattlesnake, the Shorthorned Lizard, the Side Blotched Lizard, the Striped white Whip Snake, and uh, the amphibians include the Tiger Salamander. So another cool thing I saw in the park was that apparently there are colonies of Cypro cyproto biotic soil which is like living soil and there's like mounds of them throughout the park which i think really fucking cool but i also was like is this a fucking alien what the fuck is this like it scared me a bit i was like what the fuck it looks like something scary i saw like a photo of it on the side of like the research thing and i was like what the fuck is this it's just like this mound and it kind of looks like a i want to say like an anthill if you chopped it in half and you saw all like the tunnels in an anthill it felt like that it just felt weird. So now we get into our last section, which is your activities that you can do in the park, which I think um, are really fun. This is definitely more of a scenic park, but I mean, dude, you can go hiking. It's also known for hiking, but it's also really scenic. It just sounds like a nice park. So most park visitors do the scenic drives. These scenic drives provide 13 different viewpoints where you can go and look into or see the park. The park has eight marked and maintained hiking trails that can be hiked in less than a day. So you don't really have to pack for a whole day. So I'm going to tell you all of them because I thought it would be interesting considering there's only eight of them. So we'll get started with your easy to moderate trails. That includes the Mossy Cave Trail, the Rim Trail, and the Bristlecone Loop. Your moderate hikes are the Nahavo Loop and the Tower Bridge. And then your strenuous hikes, which are meant for obviously uh, like lifelong hikers. <laughs> <laughs> are your Fairyland Loop and your Peekaboo Loop. A uh, cool thing about these parks is that all of their trails are connected, or like they connect at some point, so you can combine trails to make your hiking even harder if you wanted to and have a nice day out, you know, hiking in the parks. So the park has two trails that are designated for overnight hiking, um, although for these trails you do need a backcountry camping permit for both, you can't just go hike them. The Ring Spring Loop Trail and the Under the Rim Trail are both trails that are, uh, these, um, you can consider these your overnight hiking. So there are more than 10 miles of ungroomed skiing tra uh, trails which are available off multiple trails so you can go skiing in the park. The area in the area, uh, can be so clear which this shocked me, they can be so clear that on most days from the Yo Vimpa and Rainbow Points, you can see the Nahavo Mountain and the Kebab Plateau, which are 90 miles away in Arizona. That's wild, dude. Um, on extremely clear days, you can see the Black Mesas of Eastern Arizona, which are 160 miles away. So this park is considered a good stargazing site, but it is not as dark as Big Ben. You can definitely see a lot of stars here, but you're definitely not going to see as much as you could uh, in Big Ben, although it is still relatively a good stargazing point. The park has two campgrounds. Uh, one is open year-round, which is your north campground, and then the sunset campground is open from late spring to early autumn. Uh, and then if you don't want to stay at the campgrounds, if you want to go to somewhere nice and cozy, 
they have 114 rooms at the Bryce Canyon Lodge, and that is another way you can stay at the park if you wanted to in a more, uh, not, not really campy way. But yeah, so that makes up Bryce Canyon. That was our exploration to, through this canyon. I feel like I had fun. Definitely, uh, definitely a good, good park to cover. Uh, relatively short, but I still think, you know, um, every park is worth learning its history, um, no matter what, so I had fun. Uh, I have found out what our next park is going to be, so, oh, I just dropped my phone. <laughs> so I have found out that our next park is going to be, <gasps> drum roll please, I can't drum roll, um, <laughs> <laughs> our next park is going to be the Great Smoky Mountains, I believe. Let me make sure I got that, that text right. I asked, uh, yeah, I asked my mom again what park we should do, because I just can't decide, dude. There's so many that I want to get through. Um, but yeah, so our next park is going to be the Great Smoky Mountains. I'm super excited for that one. That one might take a little bit longer to research, so it might be... Tuesday if we get lucky or Wednesday but I do hope that park I'm excited for that park I love mountains I love forests and the Great Smokies are such a pretty pretty national park anyways before I start rambling on about a park that we'll be covering next week uh, I will see you guys later and until our next adventure may your trails be filled with wonderlust and I will see y'all in the parks all right goodbye